You know, drugs and alcohol, uh, you know, I never used one without the other. The drugs were the closest thing for that adrenaline rush for me of throwing somebody out. You know, the ball's hit, you get under it, the crowd's starting to build, the guy's tagging, the whole play is being created in front of you. And then when he's out and the roar of the crowd and that adrenaline rush you get. When baseball wasn't there, that's what, that's what that did for me. And that's what got me addicted so quickly. Growing up, I was, I was really good at sports. You know, that's all I ever wanted to do. And that's all my life focused around was playing and being a part of a team. I got drafted after high school to play professional baseball. Did really well. And I had more money than I ever wanted to have. Um, you know, my parents were, were there watching me play. It was a dream come true for me. So me and my parents, um, on the way home from a spring training game, got in a car accident. Um, a dump truck ran a red light as we were turning left and plowed into us. The two things I really knew in life, baseball and my parents, were taken away from me at the same time. Um, so I had to find somewhere I could turn where I felt comfortable. And I don't know if you've noticed, but I got tattoos. I started getting tattoos, hanging out at you know, the parlor all day. And the people there, they were good people. They just made bad choices. Uh, that's where I was introduced to my first drug and my first drink. I went down a path of destruction. You know, I actually got suspended from baseball. And it wasn't because of anybody else. It was because of the way I was living, the choices I was making. Everything in my life up until this point, I could do them all. I didn't need help from anybody. I was good at everything. And this, the drugs and the alcohol, I couldn't stop doing it. And I wanted to do more. And it, was, it was just, it was, it was chaos. You know, there was this guy in his suit, dark suit, and, you know, I was, I was fighting him. And, you know, I know, I, I know it was the devil because I was fighting him and beating him and knocking him down, and, and he just had this cold smirk on his face, and he just kept getting up and coming after me and coming after me. And, you know, I was to the point where I was worn out, and I, and I couldn't fight anymore, and I woke up. It scared me so bad that I got up out of my bed, <laughs> went across the hallway to my grandmother's room, knocked on the door. I said, Grandma? She said, yeah. I said I had a bad dream. And I said, can I, can I sleep with you? That's a 25-year-old man asking if he can get in the bed with his grandmother. And uh, you know, she welcomed me in. And... The next night, I asked God, I said, I said, I need help. I said, I, I, I've been trying to do this so long that I can't do it anymore. I can't, I can't try anymore. I said, because I fell on my own. You do with me what you want to do with me. But I surrender. And I noticed the Bible at the end of the bed, and I started... Just looking through it, and the verse that caught my eye is James 4, 7. It says, humble yourself before God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. And that's exactly what I did. Within six months, I had the same exact dream again. You know, I was knocking him down and, and beating him and hitting him. And, um, he stood up, and he just looked at me. And I looked to my side. And I didn't see Jesus, but I knew he was standing beside me because we started chasing the devil. And I never woke up feeling more calm and at peace than I ever have.
I'm Josh Hamilton, and I am second. Thank you. What a great honor to be with you today. Thank you so much. I welcome you and the Gardner congregation as well to what God has for us today. What an opportunity. I, I'm telling you, this is very, very passionate deal of mine. I could hardly wait. I'm about to chew the seat in half down here waiting to get up here. I'm so excited for what God is going to do today. And I hope even right now, right out of the chute, that you will raise your expectation of what's going to happen in this room in the next 40 minutes. Because... As well, even though this is centered on a message to men for four weeks, which is awesome, Steve. Thanks so much for planning this. Pastor Gary, the leadership team here, for having a passion and heart, understanding that in a house that has a great wife, has a great home, has great kids, if it doesn't have a dynamic man leading it, it's destined for failure. A dynamic man. In other words, investing in the life of a man infiltrates and builds up the foundation of everything else. I'm not discounting women at all. Please don't take it that way. But I'm saying you can line up an awesome lady right next to a guy that's about half full, and it just drains the life out of her. I found that investing in, life, in the life of a man positively impacts every area of the world, every area of my community, and especially in my church. So, buddy, you better be ready. I am ready to load up the shotgun today. Are you? <laughs> so excited to be with you. I bring you greetings from the great mountainous part of our country, Wichita, Kansas. And so, <laughs> only place I've ever lived where you watch a storm form for three weeks before it hits your house. I moved here from Casper, Wyoming, and a, a worship pastor in a church out there, so this has been a bit of a shock, but uh, we love it, love it here today. Let's dive in on this idea of game day of fighting like a godly man. We're going to have the opportunity in August to invest in every guy in this room if you'll plan to attend a men's retreat that's coming your way. An opportunity to figure out what it means, like Josh specifically today, to be a guy who has a great heart and a great intention to be a man of God. And sometimes things happen in our life we just totally did not see coming. And how we deal with this, how we fight back into the game, in other words, is so crucial today. Guys, I've seen so many great men in my life, friends and family and even family members and, and dear mentors lose it all because of the way they responded to what we're going to talk about today. Game day. Josh Hamilton not only turned out to be a pretty decent ball player, but last year was named the uh, American League Most Valuable Player. I mean, for us, certainly today, right before us, he serves as an example of what it's like to uh, completely be knocked off the saddle and find a way to get back. But it certainly didn't just happen because he's a great guy. In fact, it doesn't matter whether you're famous. It doesn't matter how much you make. It doesn't matter how wonderfully uh, beautiful your wife is or how happy your home life may seem. It doesn't matter how talented you are, what you've accomplished. Certain situations, would you agree with me? They just flat knock you out cold. If you don't believe me, ask Tiger Woods today. The number one player in the world. And here's a guy who can't even hardly make a tournament anymore. I mean, a man who's been given so much and completely derailed by has something that had nothing to do with golf and everything to do with with his life. It knocks us off our game. I've been there too. Our center, our confidence, especially when these things in our life that are so important really have defined us. Uh, the elements of my life, maybe my, a job change rocks my world. Maybe, maybe something I've been looking forward to doesn't happen, or maybe lately for many of us, the economy, my retirement that I counted on has been taken away, and now everything I was counting on, everything I was defined by, has been ripped away from me. And when it's all taken away, and that's what we relied on for our confidence, our identity, we seem to have no way out. Happiness and contentment and security, there's something that we've all worked for very, very hard. You know, we hold on to it. The joy of life, the happiness, the contentment, the security. And when that's threatened, when it's taken away, 
Sometimes we lose our identity and we begin to think in ways that God never intended for us to have to think about. I have a lot of friends like you and they always have great advice, you know, on how to handle situations in my life. Uh, Pieces of advice I've heard are, well, you must have angered God somehow. That's why you're having to go through this. He's getting you finally. (laughs) You know, the lightning bolt is, is you've got a target on your forehead. God's mad at you and that's why you have to go through that. Or maybe your friends have said like mine, well, why don't you just go buy something? Just go shopping, you'll feel better. (laughs) You know, you're still being a mess, but you'll look great doing it, you know. Go buy something. I've had friends say, why don't you try something different? You know, like if your marriage is in trouble, why don't you try a relationship with somebody else? Go get a new husband, go get a new wife, go get a new job. Why don't you go buy a house? Why don't you just move like like geography is going to solve this issue for me? We all know that doesn't work. Some people just say, well, why don't you just relax and take time off? Clear your head and it'll all get better. But you know as well as I do that the reality you left to go to that cabin will be waiting for you when you come home. But the one piece of advice that confuses me the most, and I apologize if this is the one that you use, are the people who say, things happen for a reason. I just want to slap them, don't you? You know, like there's some mystical, you know, world circumstance that's directing my life rather than understanding that I must turn my face uh, to my Heavenly Father. Title of my talk today is very simple. As an athlete, men, as a business owner, as a father, as a husband, and certainly for our ladies in the congregation today. The title of my talk is Shake It Off, Fighting Back to Get Back in Tune, Back in Line, Back in the Game. The question I want you to consider today is, how do I, even can I, recover my life following an unexpected curve when the circumstances of my life have, in fact, knocked me cold, knocked me out, when my situations seem to be running my life more than me being in control and leading my life through Christ, when I begin to, in fact, start questioning everything, Isn't that weird how that happens? When one bad thing goes wrong, you start questioning everything. It's like when your car starts knocking, you take it in, and they find five more possible things, and you go, great, just fix it all, (laughs) rather than the one issue. It seems like everything's going wrong. My situation then becomes the actual signpost of my life, if you're like me, where everything isn't perfect. There's some issue in my life that I I constantly find myself focusing on. My my concentration, every thought I have, everything that, that is good or bad that happens to me filters through this situation in my life. I become blinded, in fact, by situations that derail me. My entire attention, in fact, is focused there. Well, in the New Testament, in 2 Corinthians... About uh, chapter 4, verses 17 to 18, we read these words of wisdom for us all today. It says, For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what we see, not what is seen, but what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. It's a, it's a piece of evidence of panic in my life where I become a person that reacts to everything I see, what possibly might come, rather than focusing my eyes completely on God's purpose, on his strength, on his wisdom. And I find in my own life, maybe you can relate today, one sure sign, one absolute piece of evidence that I'm headed in the wrong direction is when the focus, the direction of my life is far too focused on what I can tangibly see, that job opportunity, the economy, that relationship, rather than turning my thoughts and my focus really on what is God saying and speaking and intending through this. Instead, I concentrate on what I can fix, what I'm in control of. In your notes this morning, in your worship folder, there's an insert On the back side or on the top of it, it says game day. If you'll pull that out quickly. Game day. At the top there, I've given you a chance. I don't know about you, but I'm not real into preaching. 
I'm not in, really into just listening to somebody get me inspired, but I'm totally into someone who practically helps me figure something out. I hope that's what we do today. So practically, in, in approaching this idea, the top line says, my scene, S-E-E-N, my scene for today that God would have me consider. What is that issue in front of me that seems to have captured my total attention? Maybe for those of us who are in high school and you're headed to college even, your focus is college, education. What am I going to major in? Maybe God is saying, refocus but for now, that seems to capture every thought you have. Here are some other ideas. Maybe it's a tragedy that is the tangible scene before you today. Maybe the, like Josh Hamilton, you lost your family member in a tragic accident, and that seems to define everything. How about your financial decision? A lot of that's going on in Wichita, I know, right now. Uh, maybe it's a divorce. Maybe you're, not either, you're either going through a divorce today Recently, that's been a part of your story. Or maybe you were divorced 30 years ago in a failed marriage, and that seems to define and, and capture all of your attention even today. Divorce. Maybe it's a job change. Either you cho you're choosing one or one's being chosen for you, and that's the focus that you see. How about a health issue? Some of you are in testing perhaps right now, wondering what's going to happen, what's going to be the outcome. A disappointment, something that you counted on, maybe a vacation that's not going to happen, maybe a raise or situation that's not going to occur, maybe even more tragically, infidelity. How in the world, how in the world as a Christian person do you pull it together when you've been betrayed? Whew, tough. A family conflict. This is one that's very difficult to escape and get away from. You got to live with them. I have a talk I do. It's called Conflict Resolution Learning How to Get Along with Those You're Stuck With. <laughs> Conflict at home, man, it just, it just pours that green slime that you see on TV shows. It just pours green slime on everything. You can't get away from it. Well, I want to talk to you today briefly about three foundational understandings that certainly in our time together today, our brief time together, only three I can talk about that have. God has just been teaching me and, and helping me refocus my eyesight for the seen to my vision and my concentration on the unseen, his incredible wisdom and understanding. Here's the first one for you today. These are in your notes. Number one, foundational understanding of the unseen. I'm stunned by disappointments, failures, tragedy, when I can't believe this could happen to me. I'm unaware, I'm unprepared, in fact. I just never dreamed that it would pass. I mean, I go to church for Pete's sake. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm faithful, I, I'm in men's fraternity. I, my parents grew up in this church. How could something like that possibly happen to me? The challenge in this unseen is to be prepared now coming to church and listening to the word and studying his word to figure out how to build such a, a strong foundation in my spirit, in my mind, in my emotions, and in my heart that I understand how to sustain, how to win in the midst of a trial. Ephesians in the New Testament, chapter 6, verse 13, it says, Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when, not if, when the day of evil comes, and I'm not saying that if you're in a difficulty, you're in the midst of evil, but our human nature in thinking and how to handle situations, that often leads us to evil. When the day of com evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Understanding that those situations, and those weakest moments are the times when, when evil has that chance to overtake me. I love playing baseball, never was very good at it. I grew up in St. James, Missouri, down south and east of y'all here. And that, we say y'all down there, by the way. And uh, I learned early on in high school, maybe Steve, you did too if you played ball, that, that the, 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 the best chance that you would have as a hitter is, is following someone who just hit a home run. The pitcher's freaked out. 
he starts to overthink things. He starts to overpitch, perhaps. His, his confidence has been, has been uh, thwarted. He doesn't have that stamina, perhaps. He's beginning to wonder and think too much about what he's doing and wondering if maybe he still has it. That's the time to get your hit. And in the same way, when the pitcher becomes distracted, he, he senses he's been defeated already. He's, he's already been prone to, to, to a, a mistake. That's the time to get a hit off a pitcher. And in the same way, in your life and mine, friends, every day Satan is waiting for that opportunity where I allow that stunned, oh my goodness, I can't believe this happened to me, for an opportunity. I promise you, I'm telling you, I'm testifying today. I often hear scripture misquoted in this topic. Friends will come to us and say, oh, never fear. God will never give you more than you can handle. We know that's a lie, right? Right? Yeah, we know that the concept that God will never give us more than we can handle is totally bogus. Check it out. Look here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, right out of the first sentence, it says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. It doesn't say anything about the situations of life. It's just about temptation. Friends, let me, let me be very honest with you today. <laughs> I guarantee you, God will allow you to be overwhelmed with situations. I guarantee you, he will give you more than you can handle. Why? Without that, why do we need him? It doesn't require any faith to be safe. It doesn't require any faith to stand on the dock. It takes faith to dive in the water. I guarantee you today, don't be stunned. God has in his plan to allow situations to challenge your faith in him, to test you, as he says in Malachi, and so you can test him to see if he's a faithful God. Come on now with me today. Be realistic. There is disappointments and challenges every one of us face. We are not escaping it because we go to a church. We're not escaping it because we even, in fact, we're in love with God. There is sadness and loss and disappointment that come our way. No place in scripture are we instructed that we are hidden from that. Living this way is like living in Kansas and think you will never see a torrential rainstorm with hail and perhaps tornadoes. I mean, I love the people who move here now, and I was th unfortunately one of those. But, uh, you know, when people who move here and, and they just think, well, we live in a safe neighborhood. Ha, yeah, I'll talk to you in a year. Be aware in other words even more however of the battle for your life and mine during these moments i love waking up in the mornings and understanding in jeremiah 29 11 that god has a great passion and dream for my life don't you love that i i can tell i'm in a room of morning people here some of you have a smile meter completely stuck on zero by the way I love waking up in the morning with the understanding that God has a vision and dream for me today. Man, that's worth getting up for. It's worth getting up out of bed knowing that God has something he's going to use my life to enact today, either in my life or for the good of someone else. And every day I wake up with going, God, it's illegal amounts of fun to follow you, knowing that you're directing that you have a vision and dream. But friends, let's not be mistaken that in heaven, while they're rejoicing, while they're coming down from the clouds to lead and guide my life, while the heavenly Father has a great dream and vision for my life and yours, so does Satan. Hell is completely populated with good people who forgot that Satan also has a very passionate dream and vision for your life and for mine. I accomplish God's vision by fighting for what he wants me to be. I can accomplish Satan's vision just by standing still. I don't have to do anything to accomplish the mediocrity Satan would call me to. 
Am I a person who's stunned? It's at our weakest moment, certainly, that God uh, loses the opportunity sometimes, and Satan has the greatest. And I often dismiss the power of God around me, living as a weak man. My challenge for you today is simply this question. Do I see how Satan may be winning, using the situation, the scene before me to defeat me and the way I think? Am I a person who's caught in what we call the stinking thinking syndrome, where every thought leads me deeper and deeper away from the vision and will of God? Am I a person who has learned the technique of dismissing those thoughts by saying, is this way of thinking and acting and talking is this from god is he speaking through my life these words or if i bought a lie in this situation constantly ask yourself friends today as i'm learning as well the first truth under the first unseen today of being stunned god is at work behind the scenes in everything that's happening in my life and yours i should not be stunned if and when he puts my faith to the test Am I aware of his presence, and do I trust him with the outcome? Foundation number two. Not only should I not be stunned and blown away that God may allow that stuff to happen in my life, but secondly, do I know the difference between try and triumph? Do I know the difference between just trying to get through a situation and winning and triumphing through it now my parents were preachers my dad was and pastor and you know i got sermons eight times a week you guys just have to put up with it once but i remember sermons growing up and talks with my mom and dad about my attitude more than my actions maybe you do too where my attitude was challenged more than my actions and what i was taught is that the outcome is determined more by what i think about it by the attitude i choose ahead of time than how i respond to the situation see many times we wait for the situation to come, to occur and then we choose our attitude about it i'm challenging you to step back away from that choose your attitude first how what's my resolve in light of this situation what's my resolve ahead of time if God had his dream for me what kind of person would I be and how would that person handle that rather than oh my goodness what will I do <laughs> panic what's your attitude here's a simple example of how my mom and dad taught me how to act my attitude a quote that my mother gave me one time says blessed is he who hustles while he waits you see this athlete you see athletes preparing and training before they run the race and my mother was saying to me your attitude is God is not going to strike the ground with lightning for an answer until he sees you being faithful first blessed is he or she who's hustling who's preparing ahead of time everything about them while they're waiting for God to answer attitude first peter later on in the new testament chapter 4 verses 12 to 13 says dear friends don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on to you to test you as though something strange were happening but i think we have a misprint somebody typed this wrong that can't say rejoice can it but rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may, you got to be kidding me, overjoyed? Woohoo! How many of us have that kind of attitude when we get our kids' report card? Overjoyed! <laughs> when, one, uh, when one of our kids wrecks the car, thank you, Jesus! I can't say that that comes very natural to me. But what would it be like if my attitude today would be, God, I don't know what you're wanting to accomplish through this, but I will choose the overjoyed attitude of rejoicing that you're going to work in this situation. 
I will choose this attitude first, God, before I wait and just react to what I see. Even in James chapter 1, we read, Dear brothers and sisters, when trouble comes your way, consider it (laughs) an opportunity (laughs) for great joy. You know why this sounds so absurd? This is so unlike you and me. We live more in regret and denial and justification than we do in joy. Now, I'm just assuming that because you're human like me. I once asked a friend who was in his third marriage, uh, can you see how God's worked through this? He said, Todd, I don't even believe in divorce, and yet uh, the first two marriages I was a part of, the, the wife annulled the marriage within six months. I haven't even been married a full year, and I'm, I've been married to two women. He said, I, I'm just messed up. I jacked up God's vision for me. I'm in my third marriage, and I was challenging him to get involved in our church, and he said, oh, I'm damaged goods. You don't want to mess with me. And I said, dude, have you ever read James? <laughs> it says, count it joy when you face trials of many kinds. Have you ever prayed the prayer in the midst of this situation? Thank you, God. Thank you for this scene before me. Thank you for this challenge. It gives me a chance to trust you more. It gives you a chance to work a miracle in my life. I count it joy. Friends, I watched this man completely turn his life around in that one little conversation. What does it mean to try in these situations? First, it means that I constantly replay the worst scenarios. Rather than winning, I just play the worst scenarios of what possibly is going to happen, and then I spend all day worrying about them. I try in my own strength to solve the issue, to fix the problem. I'm working on it every day, to see, others, uh, see the way other people handle the situation, and I justify my own feelings of regret based on the fact that everybody else feels that way. I hurry up the process in hopes The pain will go away. I'm running from pain. And God says, oh, so ridiculous. Be overjoyed. Overjoyed. To triumph, on the other hand, means it requires a much deeper, greater commitment on my part to fully give my attitude, my worrying, my outcomes, and my doubting to God. It requires such a deeper commitment, doesn't it? I love this book by uh, Tim Bowden. It's entitled, One Crowded Hour. It tells of the incident of these gentlemen here, the Gurkhas who uh, were uh, raised in uh, 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 Indonesia, Borneo area. This happened in Borneo uh, between a a confrontation between Malaysia and Indonesia in about 1964. A group of Gurkha soldiers were called on to fight. They were from Nepal, actually, and they were asked if they would be willing to engage in this war with the British Army and uh, fly in, be flown into the war zone in transport planes and jump out of the plane. Now, they had provision to reject this plan because they really had never been trained to be a paratrooper, but they were invited to participate. Now, the Gurkhas were a pretty courageous people, And they rarely, if ever, back down from a challenge. But on this occasion, they asked for a provision to reject this invitation. (laughs) But the next day, the CEO of the Gurkha Army, the NCO, sorry, the NCO, he sought out the leading British officer who made this request, and he said, our leaders have discussed your invitation to fight in this war in this way as paratroopers, and we are prepared to jump out of the plane with you under certain conditions. What are the conditions, said the British officer. The Gurkhas told him that they would jump if the land was marshy and reasonably soft and there were no rocky terrain to have to land on because they were inexperienced in falling as a paratrooper. British officer considered the request and said that the drop would almost certainly be in the jungle where it's nice and, and uh, marshy and, and viney and uh, there, would no, there wouldn't be any rocks to fall on. He says, was there anything else? Yes, said the Gurkha soldier. They wanted the plane to fly as slowly as possible, no more than 100 feet above the ground. 
Well, the British officer pointed at the planes and he said, well, we always fly as slow as possible, but flying at 100 feet above the ground would be sure suicide because the, the parachute wouldn't have time to open. Oh, said the Gurkha soldier, what's a parachute? <laughs> when I'm talking about commitment for your attitude today, I'm not talking about trying. I'm not talking about giving it the good old boy effort. I'm talking about a total surrender of your attitude of to change your thoughts about this situation in your life. Three commitments I'll challenge you in today. Number one is this. Be quiet. How many times have you been around a person and every time you're around them, they want to tell the same sad story of what happened to them again? And we end up glorifying the situation and the pain you're in. <laughs> rather than glorifying what God might do. Oswald Chambers says in uh, My Utmost for His Highest, in March somewhere, in my devotions over the years, <laughs> shut your mouth. <laughs> when you're in the shadow of God's hand, that's when God wants to speak the most. But when your flap is trapping, sorry, when your trap is flapping, <laughs> or whichever, you can't hear him. It's amazing. Be quiet. Secondly, engage and commit fully in whatever God's plan and vision is for this incident. Completely give it over to God. My family and I were trying to sell a house in Wichita in the last year, 2010. It was on the market for one solid year. Over 75 families came through our home and not one person made an offer. We had a contract on a beautiful home in the country. We lost it all. We ended up back at the house. I have three sons, two are married and gone, one at home, and I heard him say, man, why doesn't God answer our prayer? You know what happened in that year? We all learned how to pray. It was no more, God, here's our will and desire and here's what we want. Please, God, would you sell our house? It became, God, what is your dream? What is your will here? What do you want to see happen? Four months later, I let an eight-year-long friendship with a neighbor turn into a salvation opportunity. And my buddy Dean accepted Christ over a minnow bucket in a fishing boat. I've been hunting and fishing with him for eight years. If God would have sold the house, I'd have never had the opportunity. Four days later, I got to lead Christina, his wife, to Christ. The unseen was happening all along, friends. But if I have to lose 10 more houses for more opportunities like that, I'm in. God, what's your vision and dream? I totally surrender. My commitment to you, God, is to not listen to everybody else about marketing strategies about houses and change your shower and change the carpet color. But just go, God, do you want to sell this house or not? Whatever you want, I'm in. And last, come closer to the right hand of God it's amazing how proximity works with the Holy Spirit I can't hear him unless I'm right next to him I can't hear him unless I'm listening take all of this effort to fix what you're working on in other words when it comes to this incredible challenge and bring all of that effort to find a way to come closer to the right hand of God he calls us in August we'll be challenging the men of this church the guys who are 13 years old and older come on Come, come, come to this event. We're going to be challenging them on how in the world do I take the list of all my burdens and all the energy that I'm using to try to fix it and find a way to get closer to the right hand of God. My question for you is, is my attitude concerning this situation leading me actually toward a triumph under these circumstances or am I just settling to complain and gripe and try to make it better, make it through? The understanding, a commitment to preserve my attitude to resemble that of Christ leads me to a triumph, not just survival. And last, as we close today, 
Not only should I not be stunned, not only should I understand the difference between just trying to get through this and winning in the midst of it, but the last one is, am I confident today that I am a man or a woman that God actually has his hand on? Am I upheld, in other words, by God? Psalm 37, in the middle of the Bible, chapter 37, verses 22 to 24, has this gem for us as we close. Those the Lord blesses will inherit the land, but those he curses will be destroyed. If the Lord delights in a man's way, his life, his faith, his attitude, he makes his steps firm. Though he stumble, he will not fail. He will not even fall. <laughs> For the Lord upholds him with his hand. What happens when God's upholding someone? He's supporting, he's strengthening them. And that kind of guy looks like this guy who's committed to that concept of eternal referral. Everything that happens to him, he goes, God, what's your plan? What's your concern? God, let me have that. Let me have that resolve and that commitment. Let me concentrate fully on, uphold me, God, in that, in that picture. That guy also is consistently laying his life up against God's vision for him to see if there's anything in his life that separates him from God. God never leaves us, we know that. But our decisions and our attitude and our commitment take us away from him at times. And the third commitment I ask you to consider, steps over the shortcuts. A man, a woman solely committed to God's vision, to being upheld by him, steps over the shortcuts of our world. Instead, he desires to fight regardless of the needed effort. He will do whatever it takes to be that man solely in the hand of God, upheld by him. I made the mistake early on in my life thinking that if I attended church that the Holy Spirit's power was available to me. I found out different. God's power isn't just available to me because I'm a good person. But when I'm committed solely to him, he upholds, it says, my life. This is a, a website on the internet you can find. Uh, it's called There, I Fixed It. <laughs> And it's for those of us who just fall short of really taking care of the issue. Here's the first picture. Maybe you can relate. This great mechanic. Okay, hon, get the kids in the car. We're ready for vacation. How about this next one here? <laughs> this is a generator on the trunk with an air conditioner in her window. <laughs> Enjoy the ride. How about this one here? <laughs> It comes with a free air freshener, in fact. Pringles. <laughs> there, I fixed it. And that's good enough, isn't it? How about this one here? Hey, hon, while you're riding the bike, <laughs> I fixed your bike for you. And the last one, certainly, for those of us who travel miles, duct tape fixes everything. <laughs> there, I fixed it. I promise you that when you live out Satan's vision in this area of understanding God's strength, you are tempted always with a shortcut. Let me speak directly to the men here now as we wrap up. Common shortcuts I find in my life and guys around me. Number one, I read a little Bible rather than study it daily, applying it along the way. I just get my religious fix. I go to church rather than make a life long commitment to serving being involved in ministry somehow I have my chair here in the balcony or way in the back and I just do my church thing friends that's a shortcut to what God has for you I pray over lunch rather than learn what it means to speak intimately to my heavenly father I look really religious in front of my kids but I'm not a man of prayer I turn to pornography for real answers, I think, for issues in my life, for comfort, for companionship in a hotel room, on my laptop. Can we see? That's a shortcut to love. That's a shortcut to intimacy that this world and our enemy has painted for us. I just steal it rather than earn it. I'm not willing to wait for God's timing. I act spiritual around church people and I act however I want to around other people. I love going golfing with those guys who don't know what I do. 
four or five holes into the round when they've thrown a club or two and a few words. Oh, by the way, what you do. Oh, I wish you hadn't asked. <laughs> this is going to be painful. I'm a pastor. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> Love those guys. I do, really. <laughs> How about sending your kid off to camp once a year rather than be the spiritual leader of your home for your kids all year long? How about buy Beth Moore books for your wife rather than commit a date night every single week to listen to her, to invest in her, to lead her as a godly husband? I hope Beth Moore can fix her. And last, I use simple phrases when I come to church like, hey man, how's it going? Rather than, and call that a real friendship rather than be involved in something like uh, uh, the men's fraternity to, to gain friendships here and, and, and be involved in a small group some way where I get to know people and they, me, and we invest in each other. I just give them the old greeting and I call that a friendship. Friends, are guys today, are, are you really a man that God has in the center of his hand? Are you really a man who's made a commitment to surrender your whole life to him? Because all of the rest will not happen unless he first of all has my life. He cannot uphold my life, in other words, until he has it. The question I leave you with today is this. Men and women, am I really seeking God's un? seen, anointing, blessing, strength, strong support in my life? Or am I depending on situations and circumstances to get better as I try? Am I a person God is really leading and upholding? The final unseen for today, God cannot uphold a life he does not have fully at the end of your human life, standing face to face with the evidence of how you've lived your life before Christ, much like the servant in our parable in Matthew who brings his life before his master and says, look what I've done with my life, how I gave it to you, how I invested it for you. The master has a choice. He will either say, well done, or he will say, well, I guess you're done. Friends, how will you handle the next challenge that knocks you out of course when it comes to trusting in God? Pray with me. Lord, I know that there are a variety of people here today. Some of us, God, we've known you all of our life. And this is a reminder today to trust you more, to not spend our time in worry. Some of us, God, we've made a commitment to you recently, but Lord, we need to realign this area of our life to believe in you, to depend on you, to not be stunned when you want to test our faith. And Lord, maybe there's some in our congregation today who've said, I've never made a commitment to God. No wonder he can't uphold my life. I've never given it to him. Maybe they would pray with me, Lord, I give it all to you now. I dedicate my life to you, Lord. Come and live inside of me. Forgive me for the man or the woman I've become. And God, lead me passionately to the person you want me to be. I ask you, God, to be the Savior, the Lord of my life. And I make this commitment like a Gurkha soldier today. When it comes to difficulty and challenge, Lord, I turn to you first. And right now I pray. Amen. God, thank you. Um, today I want to invite you to respond as God leads you. If you've prayed that prayer in the past and your life is being upheld by God, communion is a great way to respond. And the communion table is set on this side and on this side, then in the balcony and in the, in the middle sections. The bread symbolizes the body of Christ that was broken, and the juice symbolizes the blood of Christ that was shed. Jesus died so that we could be upheld in him, so that we could live a life of wholeness and freedom. And, and, and if your life is being upheld by God 100%, not, not playing Christianity or playing the game, not shortcutting it, but 100% full in. Communion is a great way to respond and celebrate that. Also, there are candles that are down here in the, the center uh, section, and, and candles could represent maybe a prayer that you're praying today. Maybe it's a commitment that you're making or a prayer that you're praying for someone else that you want to be a man or woman that, that is a person that's being upheld by God. Perhaps today you want to stay right where you are and maybe grab the hand of a person next to you or right where you are. You just want to begin to pray and allow God to do business with you. 
I want to invite you as you listen to the words of this song to respond as God leads you. It's time for healing, time to move on. It's time to fix what's been broken too long. Time to make right what has been wrong. It's time to find my way to where I belong. There's a way. Time for a So God, we ask that you would um, clean this old house, that, that, that you would do something heavenly inside of us, and God, that we would keep our eyes fixed on you, and that, um, 
God, as we walk closely with you, as we lean into you, that we would, in a, in a, in a weird way, God, we would experience this richness and fullness in life that only comes from you. And God, it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to invite um, Todd to come back up on stage. Will you help me thank Todd this morning? <clears throat> so Todd, you, you are going to be back with us in August to lead this Fight Like a Man conference. Uh, what, what is it that drives that conference? You, you began these conferences for some reason. What's the driving force behind them? Well, I often attended events like this, and I left feeling worse about who I am than excited about who I could be. Um, you know, preached at, uh, made to feel guilty, but I didn't have a clue what to do when I left. And so I wanted to be a part of not only receiving, but being a part of presenting a practical experience for guys. Even leaving today, you're probably going, yeah, that's great. What do I do from here? And this is an experience on a Friday night and a Saturday to give you practical steps and help you discover God's practical steps for you. So you walk out with a plan rather than just feeling worse. Make sense? So, so if, as you've been able to do this in different locations, um, how have you seen God work? I mean, what's been the result of this? Oh, wow. I mean, from guys who have been the, the, uh, um, receive, on the receiving end of a, a infidelity to uh, men who live with regrets for 30 and 40 years, I've watched God bring healing, number one. Two, to be honest with you, guys have this innate desire to do something about the situations of their life, but I, I found guys that just didn't know how. And so the, the powerful result is guys who walk out with five sentences that are going to lead the rest of their life, to direct the rest of their life. So uh, life-changing, in other words. Uh, encourage you not only to come, but especially if you have a co-worker or friend, whether they're a church person or not, oh my goodness, a dynamic experience for them if you'll just bring them. So there yeah. are many of us here who would probably like to we have somebody we know that we'd like to be at this, whether it's our husband or maybe a neighbor or friend or whatever. What are some ways that you can coach us and how to make that invitation? How do we talk about this to other people? Yeah, you know, uh, uh, personally, uh, there's a technique in my life, maybe in yours too, guys and ladies, where if there's something I want to improve on in my life, a common technique is to set my life up against somebody who's a better fisherman or a, a, a better uh, public speaker or whatever, and I learn from them. And presenting this as an opportunity to set your life up against God is who we'll talk about, but a, a model of perfection on what it means to be a man, what it means to be a husband, what it means to be a father, a better, a better person in all those areas. This becomes a strategy then for them to partake of rather than an event for them to attend. Right. Yeah. Practically speaking, inside your worship folders, the flyer that speaks to this conference if you sign up for this conference uh, throughout this series, this game day series, which ends next Sunday, the early bird rate is $35 for this conference. After this series, after next Sunday, the, the rate goes to $45. And then uh, if you wait to sign up at the door, it's a $50 rate. And so you can sign up on your connection card. You can also sign up at the Welcome Center. After, right after this service, there's some folks there. You can sign up there. And then ultimately, you'll be able to, to sign up online as well. So, uh, Todd, you're going to be at the Welcome Center uh, right. after this. If you'd like to meet Todd and, and ask him some more questions, he'll be at the Welcome Center. And uh, feel free to do that. Indian Creek, may God bless you as you go today. May we be people that are dangerous to the gates of hell. Uh, let's make Satan mad this week. And uh, may we be people that live in freedom from the hurts and habits and hang-ups that we have. May we be demonstrations of God's grace and healing power in our lives. Uh -huh.